So thanks all for turning up, first of all. Uh, I know this isn't quite the meta meetup that you've been used to in the past, um, but now seemed like a good time to kind of hold one, given that things are somewhat going back to normal and somewhat not. Um, so this is a pretty good time to get together and talk about what we can do going forward. Um, so I'll recap the structure of the evening is going to be that everybody introduces themselves and the meetup or meetups that they're associated with and feel free to talk about any successes or challenges or updates or just your experience of running them during lockdown uh, or any news you've got since the last meetup. Um, and then after that we've got three talks so we're going to have Kevin of Donut Chef who's going to talk about Donut Chef so far. Then we'll have James talking about Sheffield Collective and what it was like setting up a networking group during lockdown and having never got together in person before. Um, and then we're going to have an update on the directory for meetups in the Sheffield digital site from Saul and all goes to plan. There will be a small rough demo of where it is at the moment. Um, as you'll see in the chat box, I've written a bunch of talking points that I've collected. Uh, they're in the form of questions. Feel free to add any that you would like to talk about. It doesn't have to be in the form of a question. Um, and then in the third part of the evening after the talks, we'll kind of discuss any of those uh, that people want to. And that's it. So I guess we'll get started with people introducing themselves. And I'm going to pick Chris to start, seeing as this is his baby. And off you go. Okay. Um, well, I think you all know me. I'm Chris Diamond. Um, I'm a co-director of Sheffield Digital and I run um, some of the Sheffield Digital's events. So before the event happened, um, I used to run uh, Geek Breakfast every Friday morning at Tampa. So that's, that's a drop-in uh, networking event every Friday morning. Um, I also used to do the Sheffield Showcase events which are larger events that we used to run quarterly. Um, and I'd, um, I also uh, organized a Smart Sheffield event, uh, which was every two months and alternated with Sheffield IoT, which, which Mark runs. Um, I haven't run any of those since the lockdown started. And I'm thinking about what I, what I should bring back and how, and how they should be changed. So uh, three very different types of event um, that you know, yeah, don't work particularly well remotely. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks for that. So next up, I'm going to go with Mark, if you're ready. Yeah, I'm good. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Davies. I'm a CEO of IOTech, which are a Sheffield based uh, uh, cybersecurity firm. And uh, we uh, sort of uh, are responsible for hosting a Sheffield IoT meetup uh, with the fortunate, fortunate sponsorship from uh, Pitchin uh, from the University of Sheffield. Um, and uh, the iTech meetup was uh, sitting there as a holding point. I thought it was a good idea because I've attended a couple in London and uh, and around in Manchester and uh, down in Reading. Um, and I felt that we needed one up in the sort of, uh, in this region. I say this region, I'm actually in Shropshire. So uh, I'm having to sort of <laughs> visualize myself in Sheffield at the moment. Um, and um, uh, so, uh, so it sat there for about a year and a half and then Kerry um, started bashing me over the head and said, we really need to get one, uh, get one organized here. So um, I, uh, I with the, the support from uh, from uh, Pitchin, uh, we put together this uh, event, uh, and we based it initially at the Mindsphere Lounge in the U in the Diamond Building at uh, UOS, um, and we were uh, we built up in sort of the first four. Uh, meetups that we had um, a really good following and good attendance. Um, we were sort of hitting around about the 60 to 70 uh, people uh, physically attending. Um, and that was, it was really encouraging. I and mean, it was good for us. Uh, it got our, uh, the purpose from our perspective or the side benefit from IOTEC's perspective was that we got our name out there. 
Um, uh, and um, we, we were, the whole idea of the meetup was to create this ecosystem of IoT interested parties. Um, and then we went to a virtual lockdown. Um, and it was quite interesting to see the switch into virtual meetups. Uh, we've had three now. Uh, we're just about to have our next one next Thursday. Um, and we're still getting the same kind of attendance level, which is great, and a bit more geographically spread, which is great as well. So um, we're, we're, we're finding, we're probably going to it a bit later, but finding actually the transition from real to virtual not being too much of a difficult one. Um, I'm not sure how world weary people are getting off of webcasts and stuff like that at the moment, but maybe that's something we'll discuss a bit later. Awesome, thank you. Um, Simon, if you're good to go. Hello, uh, I'm Simon. I've been running Code Up Sheffield for about a year, which is uh, a uh, meetup for adults that want to learn to code. And uh, it facilitates mentoring relationships between people who already know and uh, people who are learning. And uh, yes, actually, we. Um, well, um, actually, this uh, next month will be the last code of Sheffield, unfortunately. Um, so this might be the last time I join you here, um, and as well as the first. Uh, like everyone else, we went virtual, um, and we have faced some problems with it because uh, the people uh, that attend aren't necessarily um, all that tech savvy, and so it has been a uh, barrier for quite a lot of people. That uh, otherwise would attend. But um, nonetheless, we have um, still had some quite successful se sessions, but I have noticed a drop off in attendance over time, unfortunately. So that's us. Cool, thank you. Um, next, I don't know if James is there. Me? Yep. Uh, oh, I That's was going to go with James. the other James, but I'm not sure. I think he went off for a bit. Okay, we will go with James Marriott then. Ah, okay. Yes. Hello. Yes. Um, I'm James and I uh, eat wonky fruit. No, um, I am uh, I'm an audio specialist, so I do some radio work. Um, in fact, this morning I was, uh, I've been doing the news on Capital and Heart from half past four, that's AM, and I'm doing the same tomorrow. So if I fall asleep at any point during this evening, it's nothing personal, please don't be offended. Uh, primarily though, I work self-employed uh, as um, kind of helping people with, with their podcasts, so editing, production, but mainly kind of strategy and consultation work, white labeling for agencies, things like that. Um, that's what ultimately led me to setting up Sheffield Collective earlier this year right at the start of uh, lockdown which is uh, a networking kind of call it a networking and support group for um, self-employed people freelancers sole traders in Sheffield and kind of the surrounding area um, I probably don't really need to tell you any more than that because I'm doing a little kind of section later on um, so I guess kind of all will become clear from that and obviously you can fire any questions at me um, later on so I'll just go back to my fruit uh, sorry to, to interrupt you there. Um, eating your fruit, I mean. Uh, yeah, so it seems the other James is here. James, if you want to try and introduce yourself, uh, go for it. Yeah. Hello, can you see me? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how well my Chromebook is handling Zoom. This is the first time I've actually talked in a zoom chat before so this will be fun um yeah so i co-run the shepherd ruby user group with eve barabash um at the moment we're not running any events i think we had an event planned literally just as lockdown was about to start and we asked whether our person was going to talk would we have to do some kind of virtual event um and but they weren't too bothered they would, would rather have done it in person and we've not really managed to find anybody else that was that interested to talk at this point in time. Um, so we've mostly been sort of promoting other events, um, other people that have been running digital events. Um, we have quite a good relationship with NW Rug, which is the Northwest Review User Group over in Manchester. So we promote a few of their events, but we've not actually 
um, running, running any of ours. So um, yeah, I guess we're quite interested to see what other people are doing um, with a view to whether we might run something digital in the future. Um, we're a fairly small group anyway, so I think people are quite happy to just attend um, other events if we don't run them and are quite specialised as well. So um, yeah, so I think that's kind of where we're up to with our um, use group. Cool, thank you. Um, next up, Kevin. Uh, hi, uh, so this is my first Meta meetup, which is uh, quite cool. Normally I'm pinging around everywhere. Uh, so I actually live up in York, but I've been running the .NET Chef um, use group for about nearly six, uh, six, seven years, I think it is. Um, and I also run another one up in York as well. So I originally from kind of Sheffield area, went to the university there. So kind of have quite a lot of ties in with kind of Sheffield still. Uh, and being a remote worker, even before COVID meant I could just sit in coffee shops in Sheffield with people. Um, but yeah, um, we've moved Dark Chef online and I'm talking about it later, so I don't really want to say too much. Um, but yeah, um, it seems to be going pretty well. Um, I also, we kind of merged the Dark Chef and Dark York together because it's kind of a pointless to kind of have them both online when we're doing similar talks. Um, and the York event, what I'm doing, we kind of started doing some hands-on kind of coding stuff recently, but it's very, because it's a smaller group than the Sheffield one, it's a lot easier to kind of manage. And that's kind of a problem at the moment, how we're going to do that going forward for the Sheffield one. So, um, yeah, so that's pretty much about it, I think. Cool, thank you. Uh, Kerry, if you'd like to. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, oh yeah, I'm Kerry Batchelder. I run my own business, uh, Connect and Create, and I tend to work on kind of digital innovation and ecosystem projects um, around the Sheffield City region. Uh, a lot, I'm linked to Barnsley Digital Media Centre a lot. Um, and yeah, like Mark said, um, uh, I'm, I've got a role at the university a day a week um, for three years. Um, so I'm quite embedded there. And so I, I, I kind of found out quite a lot about this pitch-in project, which is all about addressing uh, barriers to Internet of Things adoption and, and trying to, to help break those down. Um, so we, we kind of saw an opportunity um, and uh, Mark, as he said, had already set up the Sheffield IoT meetup group, uh, as in uh, the online group. Um, and then we talked to Chris and Chris was super helpful and we kind of worked out that we could alternate Smart Sheffield and the Sheffield IoT meetup groups um, uh, on, on different months. Every other every month we'd um, have a different one, so we'd alternate. Uh, and in front of that, we were running the Things Network. Um, so, like Mark says, it's it's gone re it's gone really well actually. Um, I think I, I do also have the concern about drop off, um, but what we're trying to do is get really good content, and I, I think that helps. Um, and kind of try and mix it up a bit with the nature of the speakers and the topics. Um, so trying to keep it fresh and so that that has been working well um, I suppose I do have that concern for the future that you know can we sustain that um, but a kind of silver lining around that is you, I think you really can get good speakers um, as in you know speakers you might not be able to normally get uh, because they're more accessible online um, and, and two two interesting things that have emerged is that um, we're starting to see this sort of bigger geographic spread and since we've gone online the uh, knowledge transfer network with, with Innovate UK has noticed our existence and uh, wants, is talking about Sheffield potentially being no, a node in a wider IoT network. Um, and then there's also an example, we think, we hope, um, of potentially inward investment that's kind of linked to the um, IoT meetup. So, yeah, we feel kind of we, we need to keep going with this and it's really beneficial for the region. So, um, whether whether we can keep that momentum going is unclear, but I think we've got something special that we need to keep keep moving forward with. That's really cool. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Saul, if you're good to go. Oh, hello, so um, I'm Saul Cousins. I'm one of the founders of Sheffield Digital and uh, most of the time I help out by looking after the um, website and things like that. Um, uh, I don't run a meetup. Um, I've been to several, several of the ones that you run. Um, uh, but I'm very interested in hearing 
or your experiences of running meetups so that I can make sure that uh, Sheffield Digital's infrastructure and tools support you. That's about it, I think. Thank you. And uh, Ian, not sure if you're there, but if you'd like to introduce yourself. Oh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, sorry. Yes, sorry, I'm late. Uh, yeah, I'm Ian Parr. I am involved with the uh, front end Sheffield uh, meetup, which has been going for a couple of years quite successfully until recently. Uh, we as a group have had a range of personal and professional uh, problems, I think, and as a result, we, we've just been completely dormant. We've not done anything at all uh, since everything shut down. Um, I'm looking to change that personally. Uh, now I've got a bit more time, um, but we're, yeah, it's just a really odd time for us um, as a group, really, as, as I'm sure you can all appreciate. Yeah, you're definitely not the only ones. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we can kind of get some ideas going during this evening. Um, so, time to move on to the talks. I'm going to get Kevin to speak first. Um, the talks were originally going to be about 10 minutes, but we're kind of making them between five and seven and a half. So if anybody's got any questions they want to ask afterwards, we've got time for that. Um, so if you're ready to go, Kevin, we'll have you up. Yep. That's cool. Uh, I don't have any slides. I've got like lots of points. And when I started putting some points down at the end of today, I uh, end up with more points than like I thought I would. Um, so can I go over kind of like kind of the stuff what we used to do and what we're currently doing and where we want to go? Um, so we used to kind of do mostly talks. Well, we used to do a set of like talks every month and a set of workshops every month. So we used to host at least like two events per month. Uh, the first one would be on the first Tuesday of the month, at, which we host at Sheffield Hallam University in a kind of uh, a lecture room. And we provided uh, food and drinks. And we got an attendance between like 30 people on average, uh, probably just over. The maximum attendance I think we had was 120 people. Uh, that's when we got John Skeet uh, to kind of come and speak uh, from uh, Reading, who works at Google. Uh, so we had like two events running, uh, one's talks, one's hands-on coding sessions. The hands-on coding sessions, we moved to um, Sheffield Tech Park just before kind of the code situation kind of fell on us. Um, and that attendance were about 50, uh, 10 to 15 people. And that was more ha kind of hands-on kind of uh, workshops and people kind of pairing together on problems. Uh, but the kind of whole idea of the Donut Chef and has been for the, um, the years that I've been kind of uh, managing it really, is to kind of like learn and share from people uh, of each other uh, and kind of, um, kind of network a bit as well. And uh, towards the kind of start of COVID was trying to get more, well, end of COVID, so whichever way it is, we was trying to get more kind of soft skills talks as well, uh, which was kind of um, raised because we focused on more tech subjects, but a lot of people wanted uh, kind of how to think like soft skills as well. Um, so since then, uh, since the COVID situation, we kind of switched straight to being online. We didn't really know how I was going to do it. Uh, the first meter went a bit screw if uh, we end up starting about 15, 20 minutes late because things weren't working properly. Um, we kind of, uh, the, to the use of uh, the Sheffield Digital um, uh, Zoom account, which is really grateful. Um, we also joined together the York group, what I kind of run with the Sheffield group. So there's a couple of people who help out with the York group and there's a couple of people who help me out with the Sheffield group. But I kind of managed both of them, but we decided to join both together because we had, you know, we have the same speakers for both of them and they travel between the two cities. Uh, so it was kind of a bit pointless kind of getting the same speaker to just do the same talk a, a couple of days later when everybody could just join together. Uh, we also paused the sponsorship, uh, which we have with like Jet2, 3 Squared, and Raygun. Uh, and this is mostly because we don't need the cash at the moment. Uh, most of the cash was for kind of uh, food, drinks, and things like that and just other auxiliary kind of uh, things we need to kind of pay for uh, and obviously our uh, like payments have been completely reduced by being online which is kind of good and bad at the same situation i'd say um but we tried to keep the kind of same like rhythm going of having one to two speakers doing about 45 minute talks each uh and quite impressively kind of our attendance within the first couple of months of running 
uh, that event was over 50 people. Uh, and we took gave a questionnaire air out every single time we kind of ran an event and kind of, it was about 50% split of people who had attended like a previous event or of like a Sheffield event or a York event and people who was outside of that scope. So there's people from like the U S joining us, people from the uh, rest of Europe and people like that. And also spread across the UK, which is quite interesting. So we actually got quite a lot of traction from other people from outside Sheffield and taking an interest in things, what we was doing. Um, but then we kind of had a drop in probably last, last like two months. I think it has been, uh, we've dropped to about 30 people, uh, but we still has to kind of have the same 50% split of kind of people from Sheffield and York and people from outside that, uh, connection as well. Um, and to be fair, it's been quite a good experience to do everything online. Uh, we still try to record the events. Uh, they're not as good quality as we're actually recording them in person. Um, and we've been trying to get uh, feedback uh, actually at the start of the events using directpoll.com, which is like kind of an online uh, quiz kind of uh, like website. Uh, we've done like previously, we used to meet at the Sheffield Tap uh, for some drinks afterwards, uh, which was quite sociable and people got chatting. Uh, and we've been trying to do this virtual bar thing afterwards after the event, but which hasn't been, it's been okay-ish, I suppose. But the film is it's not the kind of same experience in the bar. It, it's a bit too intense, I suppose, where people feel like they have to kind of talk. Uh, when it goes silent, people feel awkward. As if you're in a bar, it's a lot easier to kind of just go drink your pint or whatever you fancy. And it's, the silence is not as kind of intense, I suppose. So it's been okay if people have got things to talk about and the kind of talks relay on to things what people can talk about quite easily. But if they don't, it's kind of a bit like struggling point for people to start conversations. Um, we also had feedback from kind of speakers and attendees as well. So speakers have pretty much said like, we want people to have webcams on. And I know like a lot of attendees and there's been a lot of stuff on Twitter about people having webcams on and they feel like uncomfortable having webcams on, on meetups. Uh, but we've, the speakers of lots of speakers, what we've had so far, have pretty much said it helps so much to get, kind of engage in kind of people's expressions and kind of body language when they're actually giving a talk because you can have this like kind of zoom kind of um, screen on the other side with the pictures of people on it. Uh, and the kind of feedback uh, from attendees is more kind of about engagement really. So they feel less engaged with kind of the talk because they can get distracted by things like their family kind of playing around with other things, on the internet, things popping up, messages coming in things like that. And also the network inside of things is a lot less because it's kind of harder to kind of, um, kind of communicate, I suppose, um, when you don't really know anybody. Um, so people feel a bit more kind of shied away from kind of just coming to the virtual bar and things like that. Uh, so that kind of, it's kind of where we're currently at. Uh, and to be fair, I think it's gone better than what we expect it to be. And we've got a lot more attraction from people attending than what we thought we would as well. Um, but we've been recently speaking about kind of where we want to go um, and kind of how to make things a bit more better. Um, so as I said, we've been doing, I've been doing some like kind of remote kind of hands-on kind of uh, sessions with somebody else in York. And we've been having about four or five people attend them. Uh, but we kind of want to do the same thing for the Sheffield event, but we don't really know how we're going to set up because we usually have a lot more people attend. Um, so we're going to try to run some of them at some point. Uh, and also there was good talk about um, actually having a kind of meetup where we actually go. So we have a minimal amount of people go to a meetup in Sheffield. And um, then we live stream the talk as well. So at least the, the speaker can actually engage with the people actually in the audience, but a minimum amount of people. And also people can stream it live as well. Um, but we kind of still in discussion of how we're going to do that. We kind of have some equipment. Um, and we kind of need to, need to try it out before kind of doing it. And also we need to kind of find somewhere to host because I think the university is still closed from what I know. Uh, and also we need to consider all of the COVID things of kind of making sure we're doing things at best practice and things like that as well. Um, so that's pretty much it, um, what I was going to cover. Um, but I hope that's kind of give you a bit of insight to kind of what's happening at Donut Chef. Um, but if you've got any questions, happy to kind of answer. Yeah, that was really interesting. Thanks. Uh, I think I have a couple of questions maybe, but if other people want to jump in first. Yeah. 
Well, it's quite a direct question, Kevin. Uh, but do you did you not think about um, keeping any of the sponsorship money to cover your time? Is that is that just not something you do? No. So all all the sponsorship money goes directly on kind of just running the events. Um, I do. I've done everything, and the other kind of people who help out just do it all for free, uh, yeah, just it, as it, community. It work. takes a lot of time. That's the, that's what I find to do to do it right. It takes a lot of time, so it's very good of yeah. you. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. I get from running both events, it takes a substantial amount of like my kind of time and also chasing people for doing talks and updating things and just doing things like that is, uh, yeah, I agree. It's a lot of time and effort to kind of do it. But given that you've been doing it a very long time, it must be worth it some, in some shape or form, I hope. Yeah, I, I quite, uh, for me, I, I, I've moved away from, well, I moved from Sheffield, moved to Nottingham. I still continued running the Sheffield event. And then I moved up to York and I still continued uh, running it and kept popping backwards and forwards. And I think it's because I've got quite a lot of ties in with Sheffield still. And also it's quite, I, I quite enjoy kind of meeting up with kind of people chatting about tech uh, and kind of figuring out what else, else is going off around the area. So I kind of benefit in like kind of more of a learning sense. Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm not really fussy about kind of, that aspect things i'd rather the money go into kind of us being able to do something like buy some equipment to kind of help us do some hands-on kind of um tutorials or programming and things like that which will kind of help people's learnings that's great uh yeah so um my question was obviously at the start there was uh i guess a lot of enthusiasm and energy for all of the stuff both from speakers and attendees especially for your event you know like you said it was very well attended and since you've seen a drop off in attendees have you also found that it's more difficult to get speakers as it's gone on or is that has that kind of been a constant um i think speaker wise i think it's about the same as normal when we used to meet in person um I think it's been about a lot easier for us to get people who are from abroad. So we've had somebody, uh, two people from Canada, uh, somebody from the US. Uh, we've also had two people from Netherlands and we've had somebody from, um, from New Zealand as well. Uh, so obviously, even though they was been doing it remote, uh, the New Zealand time difference was 13 hours, I think it was. So it was half past seven at night for us. And it was uh, half six in the morning for them, <laughs> which was uh, quite impressive. Um, but it's allowed us to actually get more people from a wider scope, which is quite nice, I suppose. Um, but I think the kind of uh, finding a, uh, kind of speakers has been about the same amount of effort, I think it has. Um, I know quite a lot of all the .NET groups have been trying to chase uh, more high-end kind of .NET speakers from Microsoft. Uh, but we've kind of, we've had a few, but we've kind of tried to avoid that because there's already groups, .NET groups anyway, in the UK, have already had them speakers. And we just think it's a bit pointless kind of doing the same talk, what some of the, some of the user groups have already done. Uh, because they're all kind of global now, I suppose. It's kind of, it's, I feel like um, we might as well have as an own original content than kind of just do the same thing what everybody else is doing. Okay, yeah. Um, and in terms of getting attendees from Europe and America and Canada and all sorts of places, are you actively doing anything to get those people? Or is it like the speakers from those places advertising the event and then their contacts finding out? I think it's just from things being shared on Twitter and stuff like that, to be fair. Um, we still obviously get the, the, we still get the same kind of, I suppose, the people who would normally attend at Sheffield and York kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, attending. So the more regular people, uh, because I mean, when we used to in-person events, we always got the kind of regulars. And then we also got like kind of, uh, depending on what type of talk it is, we get a certain frequency of like different types of people attending as well. Uh, because they kind of, the whole .NET ecosystem is kind of crosses over with so much different tech. Uh, and depending on the talks, people came for actually just having a bit of time away kind of to kind of like socialize and stuff like that and also find some, well, get some kind of interest in some other kind of uh, topics and other people just came for that specific topic kind of thing. And I think it's kind of the same thing for people further uh, afield as well. And I think it's a bit easier to kind of share kind of other talks, what's going off at the moment. Uh, so 
I know like uh, ours got shared um, amongst the kind of uh, Oxford.net group um, recently and they was chatting about it as well. So it's, I, I guess it's a bit more easy to kind of share because it's, it's all online and the kind of communication is all online as well, I suppose. But we've not kind of emphasized trying to, I suppose, advertise it more online. Okay, cool. So it's just happening organically by the sounds of things. Um, yeah, yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, yes, I was very interested in uh, what you said about surveying your attendees. Uh, what sort of questions do you ask them and have you learned any other interesting things? Uh, sorry, I only got half of that. What did you say? Can you repeat? Sorry. Um, I was very interested in uh, what you said about surveying your attendees after events. I was just wondering what kind of questions you asked them and what you've learned. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was asking them kind of where they're from, uh, kind of their job titles, if they'd attended any of the current uh, previous events or hosted in person, um, them kind of like kind of uh, questions really. Um, we also kind of did some, we did a part of like kind of, um, so to kind of, kind of gather kind of metrics about kind of the attendees who are attending. And we also try to use it as a way to kind of uh, give people news about kind of the .NET ecosystem as well. So when we used to run um, in-person events, we used to have like some like news slides going around. So we used to have some music playing in the background with some news slides going around. So when people are sat waiting for the event to start, start they kind of be able to read the kind of news for kind of what's going off and what's being released and things like that as well. Um, so we kind of tried to use it for that as well, where we'd ask questions, which was about kind of what had just happened in the .NET ecosystem site, so like saying when uh, Blazor, which is the, the front end kind of web framework for .NET, uh, uh, what version are we currently being released kind of thing. And um, people get to uh, kind of guess as like a more of a kind of a quiz style thing, uh, as well as some other kind of like more kind of gathering metrics about the audience kind of um, style. Uh, Chris has got his hand up. Yeah, I was going to ask about um, about publishing the talks um, and how you record them. Do you use YouTube to publish them afterwards? Uh, and the same question to to Mark and anyone else who records the speaker talks and the interactions. How do you how do you get that out? And how is that consumed? And how much um, engagement have you had? Uh, so. We previously used to just record it in person. Um, so we used to use a, like a HDMI recording device uh, and also record uh, two cameras on the kind of speaker with some lapel mics and things like that. Um, but since it's been online, we've just been trying to record multiple, multiple kind of people, well, the, the kind of organizers have recorded uh, like the session locally on their machine using Zoom. So. Uh, within Zoom, you can record different parts of the session. So you can either just record the, the screen share, you can record the screen share and the person and screen share the person in the corner. So we've been trying to at least get like a couple of kind of recordings, one with the actual the screen share only, so then we can mix it down later. And also one with the actual speaker just on its own. Um, to, and then we can just mix it into our current background of our kind of, um, or use for our videos. Um, so we host them all on YouTube. So we kind of record them all and then process them later and then push them onto YouTube really. Uh, but the quality of them, because they're on zoom and they get compressed a lot more, uh, not as good quality, I'd say. And obviously people's equipment is completely different. So, um, people use their laptops, microphones, which is more kind of high end pitchy kind of, um, audio compared to using a nice lapel on mic um, and things like that. So the quality is not as good, but we've had good feedback on the kind of talk still. Or people still kind of watch them online. I don't know how many subscribers we've got to our YouTube type channel, but people comment on our videos and things like that. So um, it seems to be still going pretty well, I suppose. And uh, they seem to get shared around kind of well, quite a lot. But the videos, it kind of depends on the kind of topics, how many people watch them and things like that. It's like some, some of the videos have got like, I don't know, over a thousand kind of views. And some have only got still one or two reviews because they're more niche talks. Um, so it kind of depends on the content. 
Cool. Thank you. Uh, um, for tech for running the meeting. Sorry, Kerry, you were, you um, can't hear um, you. No, no, I was just going to I was just going to say, say something, but then you that you carry on. It's uh, that. Yeah, I mean, I was going to actually defer to you because uh, I, I, I'm very blessed with a great backup team um, from from the pitch-in because they they do all the recordings, both uh, when we had the uh, real live events, as well as on Blackboard, we use um, the University of Sheffield's Blackboard system um, to record the uh, various um, presentations. And then they post them on the uh, pitching um, website, uh, available for consumption there. I'm not party to the sort of number of views uh, that I had, but I often get asked, you know, uh, if they are recorded and I make the reference to them. So if I get any contacts through people from the meetup group itself who've missed it uh, or who want to have uh, refer back to it, um, I just refer them to the pitching. But I don't know, Kerry, do they, do they keep the number of views on, on, on pitching at all? Yeah, I must admit, I'm not sure about that. Um, all I can add really is that um, what they do is they um, they record the whole thing on Blackboard, which actually seems to come out as reasonable quality. And then they break it down uh, by uh, uh, time and speaker. So that if you're interested in a particular speaker, you can go to that part of the video. Um, I think a previous marketing colleague of ours actually um, sort of separated the videos out, which was quite nice. So there's two ways, kind of two ways of doing it. Um, so, but I'm not particularly advocating the Blackboard platform. Um, it kind of serves a purpose for us and the reason we keep using it is that it's the university's preferred platform and we get all the support for that. Um, they don't, they've as kind of banned Zoom at the uni. Um, so, but in terms of, uh, I think what Kevin was saying about people's faces and things, it's really not good for that. Um, it, when you're actually just sort of got a single speaker, they're like a little thumbnail down the bottom. Um, and then also when you've got multiple people kind of trying to discuss afterwards, it, it just doesn't work like this. Um, so we've got we've got mixed feelings about it, I suppose. Um, on the other hand, it hasn't let us down um, and um, people mostly seem to be able to join. It's a bit glitchy, but I think you just you need to mainly go in on a particular browser. Cool. Thanks. Um... Don't know if there are any more questions. If there are, feel free to. I, I, I actually had, I had one more question. Thanks, and um, Kevin, it was, a, and it might apply to everyone. And it's about uh, the number of women, both speakers and attendees. Um, what what I find really challenging is to to get women speakers it, all uh, across the whole time. It doesn't it doesn't hasn't made any difference whether it's lockdown or not, um, and and mainly they. I don't know they just seem and and they just they've just got so much on their plates both before and and maybe now even more after um and i think possibly after um now in lockdowns or covid times we're seeing less women attendees i haven't really looked at that but i i think um you know as we know perhaps from the media that women are particularly getting stretched and i don't i don't really know how to effect change around that because it's about people's lives. I don't know, have you seen anything, Kevin? So for us, we've been trying to encourage more diverse like yeah, attendees and speakers yeah. for, uh, for like forever, really. Uh, and it's kind of hard, I suppose. Um, and I, don't, I find it's it, like the soft skill talks encourage, seem to encourage more kind of um, female uh, attendees to be fair, um, what we found, then more kind of uh, hardcore kind of programming kind of um, talks. And I don't, know, I don't know if that's because it's a programming related kind of thing, because I'm part of like sort of quite a lot of security kind of events as well. And they get a lot more diverse kind of attendees and speakers. So I don't know if it's just because it's just software engineering in general, or it's because, I don't know, they kind of, um, where we are in the UK, um, I know the York event, the York event gets a, uh, about a 50-50% split of kind of the attendees for female and male compared to the Sheffield event, which we kind of get about one or two uh, female attendees. Um, uh, and we've been trying to kind of figure out, I kind of plan to make that a bit better, but um, I've been in lots of kind of talks as well where kind of people are saying like, 
it, it also depends on kind of the area what you where you are as well. So, like I think in York they have a lot more we have a lot more kind of female developers, um, uh, and in Leeds I think have more female developers. But I don't even know kind of the kind of population to Sheffield and kind of what the kind of I don't know the split is kind of thing. So I, it's kind of if you, if there's nobody there, it's kind of hard to attract people as well. Um, so, but it's hard to kind of figure out kind of what how you can attract I don't know, a more diverse kind of a set of people. Um, so yeah, um, we've been trying to like I don't know. There's one of the reasons why we try to do a more of a hands-on kind of thing uh, event as well, where less people would attend. So we try to encourage more people, different set of people to attend, and that that kind of helps. To be fair, we did get more different different types of people attending. Uh, to be fair, we got kind of some like teachers from. Uh, colleges and things like that who kind of attended and want to just learn about that certain subject. Um, so we try to kind of mix things up and kind of try different things, but uh, I suppose we didn't get a, a kind of, um, I suppose it wasn't that great compared to like other kind of meetups I've been to, I suppose. Uh, but kind of, we're kind of stuck in that situation where we don't really know what to try and what we've tried is what other people have kind of suggested um so we kind of had um oh, i can't remember her name um we had a talk recently by a woman from uh, nottingham and i was chatting to her and she was kind of saying the same uh, kind of the things what uh, they do um uh, women in tech kind of thing i've tried to kind of be more kind of personal and kind of um make sure somebody's on the door to kind of greet people and things like that. And we've tried that kind of situation. We've put that kind of on the kind of, um, on our kind of correspondence and things like that. Uh, and kind of that is kind of worked for like a one person to be fair, which is better than nothing. Um, but at the same time, I feel like we've probably still got a fair way to kind of go to kind of figure out how we do that better, I suppose. Um, which it doesn't help kind of being, in the middle of the UK, uh, where most people are white males doing software development. <laughs> yeah. so. I mean, I, you know, I, I try and use all my persuasion tactics and it, you know, to get women speakers to come, for example, and it, it's just really challenging. And they often will say, Oh, I, I can't do it, but my male colleague can, that happens all the time. And I'm like, no, <laughs> but uh, it's just, it's, you know, you can only do so much sometimes. Um, just an, an interesting point of fact is, um, Recently, uh, the Pitch In project that we're linked to has sponsored um, a IoT kind of making challenge um, from the university. And that, I think it had sort of uh, people attending from across the UK. And they, they purposely went for a challenge based approach. So they called it an environmental making challenge. So people thought that through making, they were addressing different environmental issues. But fundamentally, it was about IoT and you know a little bit of software and hardware um and but they found that uh, by taking that approach they got a lot uh, a much more diverse audience because they framed it in a different way but i, I think when fundamentally if you're talking about <laughs> software uh, software programming then it's it's hard you can't you can't really kind of dress it up do you know what i mean yeah and i think that's the thing like but i've, I've attended uh, i don't know the steel con event in uh, sheffield which is hosted at um, Hallam as well, uh, which is a, like a, a weekend event uh, for ethical hacking. And the kind of, you get so many di more diverse people go into it. Um, and I think it is because, half of it is because of kind of like the industry uh, is because it is, isn't that diverse in the first place. Uh, and like talk to the people is like kind of, we need to kind of change the roots of that to start off with. So we need to start with, the younger generation not if there's nobody like in the uh, 30s and 40s who kind of can attend these events anyway because they don't know anything about it we need to concentrate more on the kind of younger generation to kind of enable them to kind of come to the events learn and kind of progress like that um the we did used to get a few people from Hallam university kind of uh from the software engineering kind of and the networking uh, courses um from the Holland university students used to kind of attend uh but i think the kind of the advertising of that kind of died down about probably a year or two ago i think 
um, because they used to kind of, we used to get quite a few people attending ad hocly uh, who used to actually attend the university, which was quite nice to have kind of the more of the younger generation kind of like going to kind of things outside of um, the university as well. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, I suppose it's more of like kind of how do we advertise to kind of a more diverse kind of a set of people because the thing is, it's quite easy to advertise to the people who you know and kind of, and the people they know is probably the same kind of type of people who they are kind of thing. And you see it in companies as well, don't you? Where you, they, we, we kind of have like one or two, I suppose it's like um, people turning the webcams on when they're on like meetings, for example. If one person has their webcam on, like there's three people having their webcam on, then six people, and it quite easily expands quite easily. So once you can, I guess once we kind of can encourage a uh, few diverse people, then they can expand and they talk to other people and talk to other people and say it's not as kind of as scary as what people make out and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just kind of maybe taking the first leaps for certain people and how do you make things a bit easier for kind of people to kind of come to us kind of thing. Okay. Uh, Thank but, um, you very much. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I, don't, I, it's, I don't mean to put it at your door. It's a very challenging issue. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the only thing I'd add is um, with Mark and uh, the colleagues at Pitchin, we've been running a program with um, 11 Internet of Things um, intern students. And we had the students, uh, they've been, they spoke, uh, nine, nine uh, students spoke at the last meetup. And um, I, I don't know, Mark, whether it particularly attracted more students, but the students got loads out of it. They really enjoyed speaking. And uh, you could imagine over time, like you say, that that could actually set a precedent for more people joining. So, so kind of, I, I kind of... Sorry, to... um, sorry. Do you, uh, could we... Um, <laughs> this is a really, really good discussion. I think there's a lot more we can say about it. Uh, so I'm going to move it till uh, the third section after we've had our talks as poor James has got an early start tomorrow. Um, so we're gonna get his, his uh, update on Sheffield Collective and starting a networking group during lockdown. Um, but yeah, diversity and everything that entails is something I'm very, very interested in. So we'll definitely talk about this afterwards. And thank you guys. James, if you're good to go and not for us. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, genuinely, my alarm goes off at 3 a.m. So um, half seven is like my my bedtime. So I will be dropping off after uh, after this. I'll take a few questions and whatever, but uh, please don't think I'm being rude. Um, I also don't have any slides either, um, which is mainly because I'm just a bit lazy. I don't really have any points. Just going to kind of make it up, see where we uh, where we go. So Sophie asked me to come up with a name for for this um, sort of presentation. So I, I went with. Uh, what's it like starting a networking group in the middle of a pandemic? And I kind of regret that because to be perfectly honest, the answer is it's fairly straightforward. I'll elaborate that on, on that in a moment. The background to this, um, Sheffield Collective I mentioned earlier, is a networking group for freelancers, sole traders and self-employed people. It, you know, loosely in Sheffield, but you know, a little bit further afield. And the strap line is we may work on our own, but we're never alone. And um, it meets monthly, last Thursday of the month. It's the fifth meetup next Thursday. In fact, it'll be happening pretty much around this time uh, a week from now. The format is pretty simple. Um, kind of everyone does their little sort of introductions, 60 seconds. The, there's always one person that does a slightly longer piece, kind of five, 10 minutes max. We have breakout rooms, which we get into the habit of alternating between smaller groups and then the following month we'll have one-to-one -one breakout rooms uh, and then at the end we kind of have a little bit of a help section which is just kind of getting going whereby if someone's got a particular issue and they could do with uh, other people's input to try and solve that or kind of you know need a bit of help forming an idea or whatever it might be kind of like a bit of a, a help thing at the um at the end um so yeah um setting up a networking group during lockdown um, it's, it is fairly straightforward because you don't have any of the stresses about finding a venue. You don't have to worry about the costs. You don't have that headache of whether or not you charge people. Um, obviously it was going to be virtual. That was the only option that we had. And to be fair, the hard work of kind of teaching people what zoom was had already been done because we were a few weeks into, um, into lockdown. It, it just kind of felt like it was the right time to, to do it because, 
there was very much a need there. So lockdown had quite a hard effect, I think, on on a lot of freelancers, myself included. And, and that was kind of what inspired me to kind of, you know, get on with it and actually um, create it. I had a lot more spare time. So it, it just kind of it just fitted. It just seemed like the, the right sort of time. Um, a, another kind of good thing about it was that there wasn't anything to compare it to. So I think for all of you, you kind of have this issue of people going, oh, well, I preferred it when it was this, or it was better when it was like that. Or, you know, it's, it's easier when everyone's got a pint in their hand or some people can talk at the bar and all that kind of stuff. And I've managed to setting something up where there isn't a kind of a previous format is that there's nothing, you know, the, the, there is no point of reference to people to kind of compare it to so we didn't have that issue of people kind of saying oh it was better in real life or anything um, anything like that um how did it go well pretty all right uh we got 30 or so to the first one it has dropped off a bit since then but we generally get about half that now so it's somewhere around 15 20 ish to um to each one the the challenges really have been that it's quite easy for people to decide last minute not to bother with a virtual event. They're already at home. So it's quite easy for them to just go, actually, I'm just going to watch this film with the other half or whatever it might be. We do it in the evening, very early evening, so kind of six o'clock time. But that's kind of like a little bit of a golden opportunity for people to think, I've done my day's work or I've done whatever. I'm, I'm just going to miss this one. So that's an issue. And I guess that's a, a problem for all of us when, when we're doing something that's virtual. It's very easy for people to have, kind of find something um, better to, to do. Um, forming a network, which ultimately is, is, is what it is, is um, infinitely more difficult when people can't, kind of break off into little groups afterwards and kind of go for a pint to sort of keep the sort of conversation going. Or it might be that, you know, through kind of the, the, the in real life event, they kind of realize there's someone that they've got something in common with and they form a little bit of a, of a bond, you know, there's no, none of those little kind of conversations going on in the, in the corner. So it's made it that little bit more difficult to actually turn it into a proper network. Um, it's also not been as easy as I thought it would be to reach people. So um, quite a lot of people have gone to ground through lockdown. People, even people that I kind of know that I've been aware of have been very sort of active within the sort of the networking scene and very active within kind of the freelance community have just kind of vanished. I, I, I guess furlough might play a role in that. People who are kind of sole directors of their own company, depending how they've got it set up, they may have furloughed themselves and therefore not be around or, or, or whatever the reason might be. But there the, the have been kind of people that I thought might be interested that, that really kind of haven't got in, involved with it. Um, if I'm honest, I think the biggest challenge for it has been and will be moving forward that um, it could very easily become viewed as a bit of a one issue meetup, which is perhaps inevitable when you start something during a pandemic. And yes, you know, the coronavirus is pretty significant. That's absolutely true. But I, I kind of really don't want it to just become a little bit of a, you know, kind of a COVID support group or anything like that. There's way, way more going on in the freelance community. And I'm just a bit worried that kind of as coronavirus issues start to ease a little bit, do people think, oh, there's no need for it anymore? So that's that's a real sort of a hurdle and a, and a challenge. Um, and inevitably, of course, all those kind of headaches that we didn't have at the beginning we're going to have at some point. So those discussions about physical meetups, kind of finding a venue, all that kind of stuff at some point that is going to, going to come around. And so we are going to have those, those issues. So the good thing is that it exists now. It's a thing, you know, it's got a, we, we've got a logo. We've got some people that come along to meet up. So it exists. That's the, the, the single biggest hurdle that I think we, we've overcome, but it is still some way off becoming a, a, a community. Um, I'm pretty confident about what the future has got in store. I think the, the concept is is sound. The need for it is is there. There is kind of a gap within the the kind of the, the freelance self employed community. That's very much real. So um, you know, I'm fairly kind of confident about what the the future has in store for us. Um, I think that's kind of pretty much it in terms of what I sort of wanted to say, just to give you a little bit of background to to what it what it what it's kind of all about and, and what things have, have been like over the, f the the four that we've done the fifth one next week. Uh, but yeah, if anyone wants to fire any questions at me, please please do. Uh, so I guess kind of a continuation of the discussion that was going on beforehand is: Have you noticed that there are fewer women attending now as lock lockdowns kind of continued? 
Um, obviously, you've seen a drop off as well in attendance. But uh, how, I guess, how diverse was it at the start and how diverse is it now? Has that changed? Uh, I, I haven't kind of monitored it as as such, so I can't give you any kind of stats or anything. I would say that, that right from the word go, it's been pretty um, diverse. I think there's been a good representation of, uh, of, of, of women on it. Um, I, I think one of the things that, that I was quite keen about at the start was that it, it, it was open to anyone that kind of works in any sort of freelance industry, so not just digital industries, but, you know, I've, I've kind of got this weird target of one day getting like a painter and decorator to turn up. I don't, it'll probably never happen, but you know, I just kind of want it to be diverse in that sense. And that's something that we've struggled a bit with because it has generally been that the digital industries, particularly uh, quite a few people that work in marketing um, kind of web and, and other sort of development is, it's proved quite popular with, I guess that was inevitable just because of the kind of thing that, that it, that it is. So I think that our hurdle in terms of diversity is maybe not in terms of a, of, of a gender issue, but actually in terms of an industry issue and the spaces that people operate in. It does, to, uh, a question I was going to ask Kevin, but it equally applies James and to everybody really, is the, the timing of the meetup, uh, crucial as well to uh, to attract different types of people. I know at this time of the day, if you have a young family, for instance, you're trying to feed kids, get them to sleep, you know, what have you. Uh, so is there an optimum time to be running these, these sort of meetups? Um, or just because traditionally it was always an after work thing, that's where we've stuck ourselves rather than explore different times of the day, or indeed uh, potentially at weekends or something like that. It's a good question, and and um, I, I really don't know if there is a definitive answer to that because whatever you know, we we could discuss. I don't know between us, we could discuss six different potential start times for something, and we could all find fault with with every one of them because it would be well, I can't do it in the morning because I'll be at work, or um, you know, for someone else it'll you know kind of be what whatever it is that there's always going to be a barrier to something. So I guess it's just a matter of best fit, and I think that traditionally um, that after work sort of meetups always work fairly well for the sort of stuff in, in this loose sort of space. I'm thinking about stuff like um, Ian and the, the content club that he runs. That's kind of an after work thing. That's always seemed to work pretty well. Um, so it seemed like the most logical thing for us. Um, I, I, I don't, I really don't know what the answer is because, you know, I've been to stuff in the morning and some people say, oh, I can't go to that because I've got the school run to do um, stuff. That's at kind of like half six, seven o'clock in the morning, stuff like BNI and a few other kind of uh, more generic networking groups tend to work pretty well as a breakfast sort of thing. But I imagine there's a whole range of people who never even consider turning up something at that time. And it just doesn't appeal to. So I really don't know if there is a, an optimal time for anything. Um, probably a good thing to do is to move these things around, but then people, quite like the consistency of knowing when it is so i don't know yeah well we kind of like um chatted quite a lot before covid kind of anyway about kind of moving things to try the weekend to do something at the weekend for a couple of hours and things like that so try the tutorials of the weekend um but we got a kind of feedback from people from chatting to just people who attend that they was less likely to do at the weekend because they'd normally be more busy than actually just after work and it's quite easy for people just to kind of just stroll in after work and for people having like school runs and things like that they usually do them around like i don't have any kids so <laughs> this is from other people um so they usually kind of do their school runs around three half three uh, and then they're free afterwards um so th we kind of always stuck with the kind of half six time um we have moved it for speakers before uh, but we kind of try to just kind of keep it consistent than anything else. And I think the consistency is better than kind of moving it around, trying to uh, kind of figure out kind of where it should be placed. Because I think people would rather have consistency over kind of um, trying to kind of satisfy kind of individual kind of needs because people's kind of time moves on kind of thing. Has, has anyone tried lunchtime of interest? Yeah, so I, I, I run a, um, a tech lunch group in York uh, and we kind of get, it's not, it's just a general tech kind of thing. So anybody in tech, uh, no matter kind of what you're doing, so you could be marketing, et cetera. 
Uh, and that kind of, it only gets around four, four or five people. And it's just because most people have like a, an hour lunch. So they kind of meet for like coffee or kind of food. And we kind of show off kind of like, I don't know, pet projects, what we've got going and things like that. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a different kind of, I suppose, experience than kind of doing a talk. I think the talk thing works quite well more at nighttime where people can just grab some food and kind of uh, yeah, watch. I mean, specifically online. I mean, you know, the, the fact that we do it at six o'clock is, is entirely because, that, yeah. you know, it's physically located. People leave their workplace and before they go home, they can go to the meetup and get a bite to eat and go home a bit later. Um, but if it's all online, then actually that's maybe not a good time, especially if you've got children. Um, so may maybe lunchtime is maybe an hour and a half, and especially if there's no networking. If the networking side of it doesn't exist, if there's no alcohol and, and you know, people aren't sitting around chatting and drinking, then maybe 12 to 1.30 over lunch is actually a really good time slot for, for some events. I mean, I'm thinking specifically of Smart Sheffield because, you know, it's quite a, it's a professional event, you know, and people probably, you know, would would be able to fit it in between their work in the morning and afternoon. So from like personal experience, I get invited to sort of Microsoft events every uh, 12 o'clock on Thursdays. Okay. And I usually don't attend them because I'd rather just go for a walk outside because I've already <laughs> been sat, because I've already been sat at my desk all morning. I'm going to yeah. be sat all afternoon. And I'd rather just go for a walk kind of just down the, or into town and then around town then back home um, to kind of stretch my legs. I mean, you just um, you know, needles in your eyes and, you know, witness a Microsoft talk anyway. But. <laughs> no, they're pretty, usually pretty good to be fair. Um, so I get invited to like kind of like quite a lot of like MVP kind of talks, the Microsoft Valley professional talks, and they're really good. But kind of, you, they also get recorded. So if I actually specifically want to re watch something, I usually watch it later. Um, so that's from my own personal experience um, than anything else. And usually when like, I attend meetups as well after work now, uh, it's COVID situation. I usually go for a walk before kind of the talk as well. So I finish at like, five, half five and go for a little walk because especially if it's not raining, just to kind of stretch my legs because I'm just always sat in the same position all day long. Yeah, I hear you. Um, Mark might be able to remember this, but we did a survey on one of our online um, IoT meetup events. And I'm pretty sure the outcome, even so this was during lockdown, was that people liked an early evening. They preferred it to a morning or an afternoon. Um, yeah, on the, pretty, pretty yeah, sure we asked them. We did, yeah. We, we ran a poll and we were sort of trying out to see whether or not people preferred a different time and it did come out from that poll that uh, the, the same time was a preferred time so yeah. i was wondering whether or not there was talking about diversity earlier on you know that uh, uh, particularly if there are families involved you know around about that time tends to sort of coincide with a whole lot of activity family-wise um we, the silent majority though mark Sorry, All those again? thousands of people that couldn't that didn't respond to the survey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Time at lunchtime. Yeah, quite. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. I, I just wanted to ask James whether um, um, he's likely to make a physical event when we're allowed to, you know, be in the presence of each other again, or whether you see it as continuing as being an um, online event even afterwards. Um, I I, th I think and and you know there's there's kind of a, a long way in this kind of crazy coronavirus thing to go, but I think it's probably inevitable that because it's once a month that that will continue to be a virtual event. But the kind of one of the reasons why I kept it as 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 monthly was that it kind of gives the option to add some extra stuff in. So I've already kind of had a few discussions with a few people about the idea of kind of on the on the second week in the middle of the month having like you know just picking a, a bar and just saying that we'll be there. At the moment, that's fairly irresponsible, and and you know it's going to take kind of like a few things to change before we'd feel quite confident to be able to do that and everyone keep a, a safe distance from uh, from each other. And I wouldn't expect many people to turn up when when you know if we if we did do it sooner rather than later but longer term i think that there's there's something in that in terms of making kind of one 
regular meeting a month, which is probably virtual. Uh, and then um, kind of maybe even one or two kind of supplementary sort of things. And, and they're not necessarily just social things. They could also be kind of extra like, you know, educational things or something. I, d I don't know. I mean, he, the, the, the sort of the idea of it, calling it Sheffield Collective, was that it was suitably vague that, you know, it could go in a few different directions when the opportunity arises and we could do kind of different sorts of meetups as well. So I, I've got ideas at the back of my mind on that, but I kind of feel like it's probably still going to be a while away. It was just to add to that, James. So, so it's totally nothing to do with the Sheffield meetup, but I run a book club um, it, where I live in Peniston. And um, so we've totally moved online. There's a lot of uh, sort of older people. It's just, uh, we used to meet in a pub and obviously you can't really do that now. But um, what we did um, as an interim thing, it, just for a bit of fun, but we just uh, six of us met in a pub garden. But I can't tell you the effect that had on everybody. It was really positive and people were really so pleased to see each other. So it, it was just it sort of was had more impact than I kind of envisaged and everyone was so delighted to see each other so and that that in person and, and we were all really safe we we're all distanced so I, I, I suppose what I'm saying is I'm advocating if there is a way to meet up in person it, it's really powerful I, I yeah I totally see what you mean with that I think for me it's kind of like I probably don't want to be the person that takes the responsibility for saying to people, yes, it'll be safe. And then if 20 people turn up and, uh, um, you know, someone, someone does test positive in the aftermath, I'd kind of think, well, you know, I probably should have been a bit more responsible. Yeah. So it's just kind of like, I probably don't want to be that um, yeah, person. On, the, on a side note, by the way, I'll, I'll probably get details about that group because my mum lives in Peniston and she's a big reader. So uh, she probably doesn't know about that. I'll, uh, I'll let her know about it. <laughs> Thank you. Great. <laughs> Um, as you mentioned there, that you kind of when was um, the, one of the I think one of the last ones where we met in person for Dining Chef. Somebody actually messaged me saying they they did uh, have I um, uh, been in contact with anybody else uh, with like COVID symptoms, and I was like, oh no, nobody's messaged me, kind of thing. And he was like, oh, well, I think I might have like symptoms, and he went and got checked out, and it kind of made us a bit worried. We're like, oh my god, like if like we had like one person in our event, maybe we spread in it. Uh, but he actually wasn't, so it was, it was a bit of a kind of a scary situation when uh, he kind of messaged us. Uh, but yeah, it, it wasn't actually that bad. But yeah, kind of, if you're in that kind of situation, which is kind of one of the things what, about us kind of meeting up again uh, and just kind of doing a small group of people, kind of, we don't really want to be the first people to kind of say, oops, we kind of like <laughs> did that. It's true. Um, it's it's, it's weird that... What, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was just a really quick question just to understand with the Sheffield with the new newsletter circuit for individual members is that different to the collective um, and and or does the collective make use of circuit uh, so those are two separate things yeah circuit is for um, individual paid members to Sheffield digital uh, and it's it's kind of a place where you know uh, indie members can share what they're doing kind of shout about their successes, announce new things. Um, whereas Sheffield Collective has uh, been making use of the Sheffield Digital Zoom account, but it's completely separate. This is uh, James's baby. And um, it's, I mean, I guess there's kind of some similarities between them and that they're both attracting generally freelancers, although the individual membership for Sheffield Digital is for everyone. But there's a lot of freelancers that kind of I guess, turn up to both. And um, there is some overlap there in terms of the audiences. Um, yeah. Did I have change? Does anything to add to that? No, I th yeah, I think that's true. I think um, th there's obvious overlap there. But, you know, like I kind of say, the idea of the collective is that it would kind of branch a little bit further than kind of being the digital industries um you know maybe, maybe that will happen in time maybe it won't but um you know i think it's it's quite important for it to to kind of be uh marketed as being really available to to anyone that kind of feels like they work on their own and they could do with you know their own little um network that's kind of got their got their back um 
what I was going to say just off the back of the discussion from before was one of the the networking events that I've been regularly going to over uh, lockdown has now started meeting up again in person every week uh, with the option to join virtually instead. And I've been once to the in-person meetup um, and it was really awkward because I couldn't really say it to, to any of the guys there, but I'll, I'll kind of say it here. I went away thinking I didn't feel particularly safe there. Um, there were quite a few people that, that weren't really bothered about distancing and I kind of kept away from, from others. But then at the end, there were kind of four people all sat around a table right next to each other chatting about stuff. And I kind of thought, I, it feel, this just feels wrong. It just feels like, you know, if there only needs to be one person here that, that, that has the virus and it's just going to work its way through. And that kind of um reiterated for me about the fact that it's just i just think it's just way 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 too early i know it's probably something that you'll you'll discuss later on when i'm probably fast asleep but um you know it, my experience of that was coming away thinking i didn't feel safe there and, and i've been to pubs and felt safe i didn't yeah. feel safe at that meetup that, that, that's really interesting and i should add that the demographic of my book club means that they all take it really seriously and they were like we were massively distanced you know no nobody would have, have thought about you know getting close to anyone else so i, I think that, and, and i suppose i've known them over a long time so it is a, it is like like you say a very different situation cool uh some good discussion there if anyone has any last questions for James, now is your chance because he'll be saying good night pretty soon. Um, but let's say here, otherwise, uh, Chris. I did have yeah. one quick thing, which James may not be able to answer, in which case you can go off the bed, um, uh, which is about uh, networking. So has anybody got any good examples or experience of actually doing the networking bit online? Um, I, I, I've, I've been doing loads of it to be fair during, uh, lockdown in, in all manner of different kind of virtual formats from, I, I, I mean, kind of the quite obvious thing is, you know, kind of like a, a meetup where everyone individually says their little bit at the beginning, you kind of go around, everyone does their little introduction or pitch, whatever, it, whatever it is, pops their contact details into the chat. And if there's someone that you think, all right, they're quite interesting, then you can connect with them, you know, offline, be it through LinkedIn or, or by email or whatever else that works quite well. But actually using breakout rooms is something that I've noticed a lot more virtual meetups doing whereby you just get plonked you know kind of randomly in a room with perhaps just one other person um and that's quite good because you don't necessarily get the kind of person that you might naturally go to if if you have the choice so you know it might be someone that you on the face of it don't really have anything in 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 common with um and what i would say about i think probably with the exception of maybe one or two every networking uh, virtual event that I've been to through lockdown, I've, I've got at least one thing from it, whether it's one really good contact or um, someone that's kind of passed on a connection. And sometimes it's been a month or two months afterwards where I thought that was a bit of a waste of time. And then someone gets in touch saying, oh, I, I was at that thing that you were at and I remember you mentioning this and I know this person that wants such and such. Um, so I think it's actually got from, from kind of the start of lockdown where maybe it all kind of felt a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, I think there's a lot of, of groups that have got really quite good at it now. But is, is it possible um, to allow people to, to move between breakout rooms once they've been assigned to one? No, it's all, it's all kind of done by the the, the host. Right. So um, you 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 you've got two options. You can assign them manually, or you just kind of click the random button, and it just you just say, yeah, there's 18 people here, so do nine rooms, and it just picks and and sends them. Um, okay, so you wherever. So you could basically reassign people into rooms every 10 minutes or so. Yeah, one one of the events that I've I've been to, which was actually one that I probably didn't get very much from, was was one that's run in. Um, in the northwest i think it's kind of liverpool manchester area which is called i think it's called simply networking and the idea is everyone kind of does that little bit at the beginning and then they just literally stick everyone in a one-to-one -one room for 10 minutes you come back stick everyone in another one-to-one -one room for 10 minutes until the point where there's just no one left for it to be worth doing so it kind of lasted about three hours i dropped off after about an hour and a half uh, and it is literally 
literally just uh, like speed networking, to, 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 to be honest. Um, and that, depending on what you do, you know, I, I didn't find it all that, all that useful, that one. But I still did get one really good contact out of it who I'm still in touch with on LinkedIn. So even then, I kind of say that it was, it was, worth, it was worth doing. All right, thanks. Called, called Hop In, which is a virtual conference platform. And that has a feature in it, which is you can say, I want to talk to somebody and then you'll be assigned the next person who comes along, um, which felt an awful lot like chat roulette, which made me a bit nervous. So yeah. I'm not, I didn't actually use it. So, um, but you know, there are platforms trying to build some of that stuff in. Yeah. And none of this is as much fun as, as before Zoom did its security update at the beginning of lockdown, where you could just randomly type in some numbers and just jump into someone's meeting and interrupt it. That was great fun until they sorted that out. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'll just quickly add, add to that. So, um, so I, just randomly, I've gone to a couple of online events outside the region. And um, uh, so it was like James's, but I was actually in the northeast. And that's be, that uh, it was both on topics I was interested in. So it's slightly different than a general uh, networking event. And I found that quite good. Like I've just, you're just meeting totally, I don't know anyone in the room. Um, and they've done breakout sessions and I've made some quite good contacts. And then similarly, I went to an event uh, that was run by BT around its Adastral Park site um, in Suff uh, down anyway, Suff Suffolk, I think. Um, and now, um, anyway, as a result of that, we've now got BT probably speaking at our next IoT event. So honestly, it, it's still possible. Um, and it's then Norwich, the isn't it? Uh, oh, maybe, yeah, I'm not quite sure, but anyway, yeah, cool. uh, hopefully they, they're going to speak for us. And the only other thing is that there's a, um, a platform called AirMeet. It's uh, by an Indian startup, and I think it's free up to 300 people. And that's really good if you want to have little tables and you can get to, um, it's actually, you can see the table on the screen mm -hmm. and you can go and choose and, and sit down on the table and talk to someone. Um, IoT Tribe, the tech accelerator, were using it. Actually, I never went and sat on a table. I just didn't get around to it, but it, it seemed to function reasonably well. What was that called? Air Meet. Air Meet. Thanks. Thanks. The games dev meet up in uh, York are using Discourse, which is right. used for kind of just general gaming stuff. And they've created a similar thing where they have uh, tables and they've limited it to, say, three people per table. So once there's three people on there, you can't join that when you have to join another table kind of thing. And that has voice and video on each table kind of thing. And you can jump around and also chat as if you're kind of like virtually in a space kind of together. So you can send just random messages and then join a table kind of thing. And that works quite well for them. I've only joined like once, I think it is so. But it's different. Yeah, there's a, a lot of pretty cool ideas there actually. Um, and I don't think I'd heard of most of those ways of doing networking and breakout rooms and things. Um, so, uh, cool, thanks for the link. Um, I suppose now is a good point to move on to Saul with his quick overview of where we're, we're at uh, with the meetup directory. Um, Saul, I've made you a co-host, so you well, should- share screen button, because I do have slides. Because I'm Can I just apologise because I'm I'm going to have to drop off, but um, it's lovely to see you all and uh, yeah, enjoy enjoy the rest of uh, enjoy the rest of the meet. If anyone wants to pop along to the collective next week, let me know. Good night. Bye. 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 I have uh, slides because I don't cool. today unless I've got slides. Uh, bye, Mark. As well, sorry. Uh, yeah, you should be able to share. Cool. Uh, is that everybody? Is everybody able to see my my slide deck? Yes, thank I, you. Yeah, I can. I'm going to mute myself. So. Still remember to look up at the camera, though, because the slides are down there. So let's see if I can do that. So I, I just wanted to, um, he said, click on the right window. Um, I just wanted to, to talk about the fact that we've been doing some work for, for a while um, behind the scenes, trying to get to a point where we can publish a directory of the meetups in Sheffield on the Sheffield Digital website. Um, the original plan was to um, use the directory that was in Airtable. So uh, I don't know if any of you are aware, but the uh, uh, Meta Meetups a while ago, um, it was kind of let's try and get all of our information into um, 
uh, into a database and our table was selected. Um, looked at that, um, um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about why, why we haven't progressed that, but that was some time ago. Um, I have recently got quite a bit more time on my hands, so um, I uh, uh, said I, I promised I committed to try and get some progress on some of the directories on the Sheffield Digital website that I look after. So I just wanted to, to show what we've been doing, mostly to give you visibility and to get feedback from you about what's useful here, if anything. Um, uh, so um, get some feedback and some guidance and um, uh, uh, make sure that the, the, the work I'm doing is actually helpful. Um, because that's the way my brain works, I've written some user stories that, that kind of um, uh, represent the my understanding of what value this is providing to users, to all the different groups of users. Um, uh, so I've written those, written those down. And these are the ones that are my mental model of what we're trying to do here. They, they aren't based on any great user research. I work with teams who do really good user research, and this hasn't. This is, I, I, I'm expressing what I think the users need. I haven't proved they, are, they have. So, when we go through this and you say, be feel free to disagree with these, is I think what I'm saying. Um, try to break these down, these user stories into different user types. The first one is community members. So um, people, who go, people who attend meetups or who, who, who may want to attend meetups. Uh, and I've expressed a couple, of, a couple of stories here. The first is about people who want to find a meetup on the topic that they know they want to go to a meetup on. So I'm, you know, I'm a .NET programmer. I want to find the .NET meetup. Whereas the second is, is uh, and people can do that. They can type a .NET, .NET meetup Sheffield into Google and, and probably find the Sheffield .NET group. Um, the, but the, the second one is probably the, one of the drivers for trying to bring this together into a single place, into a single directory, which is um, that discovery thing. But when you're looking at the .NET one, you also see the one which is about R or is about um, a functional programming or, 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 um, or something of that sort, that, 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 that side thing that, that, that uh, diverts you and, and you didn't know you were interested in. So um, discovery of, of new communities and being able to find all this interesting stuff. So that, for me, that, that first one is, is important, being able to find the right, the, 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 the group that you want, the makeup you want. But the second one is the primary reason for trying to bring these together primary reason for these community members, so that they can find the other ones, the ones they didn't know about. Um, for meetup organizers, so these are the ones where you, you know, you're at the, at the end of this, you might put your hand up and say, that's nonsense, and I'm very happy to hear that. Um, which is, you know, what your needs are, what are my mental model, what my thinking of what your needs are. Um, uh, and the first one is, is, is being able to be found. So, um, you know, you run, meetups in Sheffield and you probably want people in Sheffield to know that they're there. You want those people who, who will um, experiment with your meetup and come along even though they didn't know they wanted to. Um, the second one here which is um, about you using that directory to plan your meetup. So if you're setting up a new one up or you're resetting your schedule or something like that, you probably want to avoid clashes. Now this is possible because we already have a calendar and you can see that, but there's certainly opportunities here that you may want to to talk to the organizer of that other meetup and find out what time they're on or do they normally run it at that time or um, uh, any of those things. Um, the next one is to find out what venues are available. So it's, you know, it's, it's one of the problems as I understand that you have is finding a suitable venue. So a directory of, of, of just venues um, and also who also runs in those venues may be handy for you if you're trying to find someone new to host. Um, it also might mean to say that we can gather more of these venues together. The same goes for sponsors, uh, but there's, there's, there's a, a mix of both the previous ones. One, you might want to see who's sponsoring. So who is giving money? Who is helping out these kind of things? Who could I approach? But you might also want to say, actually, that, that firm's already sponsoring that one. So they're less likely to, to, to sponsor mine. So there's, there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's a clash or a identify where you can share um, uh, uh, thing in, in there. So those are the, the what I, I think I, I think your your main needs are for the for, for the a, a directory. Uh, the next ones uh, are, are, are kind of slightly more obscure um, uh, and perhaps maybe not you, you may not have thought some of these ones. but uh, businesses want to know what 
um, uh, meetups are available because they may want to encourage their staff to attend them. So it's a, it, a, meetups are a key way in which staff, uh, people develop their skills, develop their own networks, develop their ability to develop their skills. So promoting them to, to staff is a, is a thing that, that businesses may want to do. And of course, you want to encourage them to do that. Um, but they also may want to um, either provide uh, content to showcase what they can do or to just put their name, associate their name with an event. So they may be, yes, we do all of these different things. Which of these events can we sponsor? So for businesses finding opportunities, finding um, meetups, for, which are opportunities both for them to uh, develop their staff, but also to, 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 to show potential recruits or the community as a whole what they can do with content or with sponsorship. A community organizer. So this is Sophie, basically. I didn't even talk to her before showing you, but she has seen me, so they can't be completely way out. Um, what we don't want to do is, is, is overburden a community organizer. We, try, we want to make sure that this information is up to date, but we want to make sure it's easy to keep up to date. So we, you know, if, we, if we put an awful lot of burden uh, uh, on Sophie, then she'll be able to let, do less of the other things that, that she does. Um, but also, you know, the reason why uh, Sophie is, is, is running this today and, uh, and the reason why Chris set it up in the first place was to try and get this mutual support network together. So um, having a place where all of the meetups are, uh, uh, are aggregated makes it easier to find all those people and encourage all of those people to come along to a meta meetup to form part of that network and to support each other. So that's another reason why they should be together because if they're all over the place, then people won't think that they are a coherent network or they could be a coherent network. Um, and it also increases the load on, on trying to get in touch with all those people. The last one, I was thinking about Chris when, 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 I, when I wrote these. There is a benefit, an economic development benefit to the region, which is part of Sheffield Digi Digital's remit, um, uh, about uh, what having a directory of meetups does for the city. Um, uh, allowing people who, who, who work in this area of, of saying, okay, what, what does, where does effort need to be put? Where does, what needs support? What kind of technologies and what digital stuff is, is going on here? Identifying that there is a, um, a, a center of excellence in a particular topic is something which is incredibly valuable to the organizations who are responsible for developing the economy and we want them to be able to have good information and tools so that they develop the digital industry rather than or as well as the cultural industries or um, uh, heavier manufacturing or, or, or any other things. Um, there's also a, a, a case that, that we've seen in the past which is when an organization is thinking of moving um, uh, to the north or to the country um, uh, it's very, very encouraging for them to see a very active meetup uh, uh, community. So it's one of the things that has been mentioned by companies who have moved to Sheffield or who have considered Sheffield, the strength of the community um, uh, 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 and the network and the networks and the, uh, and the meetup communities. So being able to have one place and say, look at all of these, all of these things that happen regularly and be able to support those and make sure and, and help them happen regularly uh, has a, a direct impact on how many organizations will move their operations to Sheffield. So when we get to the end, I'm kind of expecting lots of people to, to, to pipe in with those and say, actually, you've missed one or that's posh. Um, when we do, when when I tend to, to think about uh, these things, we go, I go from those. What are the what are the needs to how are we going to enable those needs? So thinking about the tasks that different people need to be able to do. So a community member member needs to be able to browse meetups. They need to be able to see a list of them and be able to then have a look at the detail for one. And they're allowed, going to look at that detail and, and and judge whether they want to go to it or not. So they're going to look at they want to want to look at things like what topics are in there. Um, and what topics are being discussed? How big is the meetup? I, you know, do I want to go to one that's 150 or do I want to go to one that's only five people? Different people will have different preferences. So, so that information will help them decide whether they want to attend or not. And levels of expertise, you know, is, I know nothing about this topic. Am I going to be welcome? Am I going to feel out of my depth? Are people going to point and laugh at me? 
Um, uh, and I think we've talk, talked a little bit about this already. So I'm, I'm glad I, I put the word inclusive in the um, uh, in the in this slide. Uh, showing people how you are inclusive um, maybe. Uh, uh, maybe something that, that, that will influence whether they want to go to that, that, that meeting or not. Of course, there's some detail about when's the next one, where will it be? Um, uh, and there's, this is one I, to be honest, when I was thinking this through, I thought actually this is something which is probably quite important, that a, a community member may want to say, this information is out of date. So it says the next, men, the next meetup is in 2019. That's clearly not, 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 not the case. Um, so uh, I want to be able to click a button and tell somebody that, that you need to update this information. Again, the, so this is the, the tasks that I think that we need to support for our meetup organizer. Um, submitting a new meetup, so when you create a new one. Um, uh, update meeting meetup information, so saying, right, I, my meetup has changed, this venue has changed or, or some other thing. I put request in brackets there because I'm thinking about MVP, I'm thinking about that we may need to moderate this um so that um a request goes in for a change can you please change this because the next meetup is now or the meetup now happens on thursdays or it, we're moving back to physical from being online so we may not be able to initially uh, enable people to do that directly so we may need to moderate that um and then that thing about find out about sponsors and venues what sponsors and venues are so how do i how do i browse those how do i look for those um and then contact information for other organizers to, to you know, um, uh, find out what somebody's experience of is at a venue or um, how they uh, have got on with a sponsor and whether they would mind you approaching that sponsor for, to support your, your meetup as well. So that, that contact information. Uh, move on. Um, the other uh, users are kind of left off. They're mostly covered by the business ones and the, um, uh, and the economic development organizations are mostly covered by browser list of meetups. So um, uh, I've left those off this list. I wanted to talk about what I think constitutes a, a meetup in terms of the information that we need to, to gather. I don't think I've got this right. Well, I don't think I've got anything quite right, but um, but this is what I'm working with at the moment. That this, this, this is the information that I think that um, we're going to collect about a meetup. So there's a title logo. There's a type of meetup. Now I'm not sure how that will be used. So that we, you know, we've we've distinguished between a code club and a regular meetup or a networking event and a meetup. I'm not sure whether that's valid or not. Um, those statuses of being active whether it's dormant, i.e. it's taking a break, quite a lot will be at the moment, whether it's defunct, it hasn't run for, for, for a year, it no longer has an organiser, it's not actually running, or the, I think the interesting one is proposed. So um, I want to I want to go to a meetup on this, and there wasn't one, so I'm proposing that, that we, we put one together, how much interest is there in it? So perhaps there is a mechanism there of, of putting something which isn't running yet and still trying to recruit helpers to do it. The topic is, of course, is, is you know, what, what gets talked about at the meetup. Bunch of contact information. One I want in particular put from you is organizers' names. So putting names on there, do I also put email addresses? Is that other contact information? Because we've got a contact, I mean, does every meetup have an email address which is, which is preferred or do we want to put email addresses next to, next to organizers? Um, the schedule is, is interesting because as soon as we start saying it happens on every, third Wednesday of every month, um, then um, does, that get, does that fall out of, uh, out of currency very quickly? I'm not sure. And, and, and how do we describe those? Do I need to make that formulaic? Or is that just a bit of text that says now and again? Or um, uh, the, the, the first um, Wednesday, which doesn't have a three in it or something. Uh, which venue it's normally at? Again, it might change too often for us to think about putting it in here. Um, uh, again, when doing this, I thought, well, actually, when we're talking about venue, most of them at the moment are not at a venue, they're using a video conference tool. Do we need to put that in? Does it make any difference? Do, does somebody say, I don't want to go to it because it's on Zoom? Um, uh, and then there's sponsors. We want to give space so that the people are able to, to, to credit sponsors here as well. I think it's important. I, I think it's likely to be important for, for you and your meetups. 
So that's that's me. So we can flip back to these when when you come back and, and, and tell me how wrong I am. Um, the venue. So this is the information I think that will, will constitute a venue. Title and a photo. The photo is just making it look attractive. It could be inside photo. It could be outside. Description of it. Contact information. Typical cost. So um, it's quite a difficult thing to put, but we could, you know, put this. You know, if you haven't got 250 quid from your budget for a, a location, this isn't for you. Or actually, if you've got because we've got capacity in there, if you've got less than 30 people, then you should be talking to these because they offer it for free. So those are the kind of things. Um, Accessibility. So I think it's, it's likely to be important that we flag up if there's any accessibility issues. This is in the upstairs room of a pub, um, and you know it, there's a bunch of stairs there. Uh, um, uh, and then facilities. I'm not sure what facilities are important when um, uh, for, I mean, because those are specifically for for a meetup organisers to know whether they can. There is a screen in there. Whether there is a, 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 an amplification system or a bar or a hearing loop or any of those things. So understanding what facilities it's important for you to, to know about is, is probably going to influence how we can check how I change these. Those things are really easy to change. Sponsors. Um, name, logo, website as, as the, the constitu constituent parts of those so that we can credit in an attractive way and link through to a website. The big question I've got here is about whether there is a sponsor which is linked to a meetup or whether there is just a bunch of name logo and websites on each of the meetups so if um uh, uh if chef tech parks is sponsoring more than one event um do we only have one record for um, chef tech parks therefore when somebody updates it will it update for everybody so that's a, a, a little bit of a technical question there um, so that's kind of describing what we've done. Um, I wanted to also talk about why we're implementing it in the way that we are. Um, as I said at the, at the beginning, it was a, initially the data was put into Airtable. When we started to look at Airtable and trying to um, publish the information that's in there on the website, what we found was without paying license fees for specific users of Airtable, we couldn't restrict who could update the data in there. Um, so it was a risk that if we tried to, if we then publish that data on the Sheffield Digital website, that we could suffer vandalism, somebody could hijack links, all of those things, uh, because you have to pay for Airtable uh, in order to uh, lock it down to specific users. And that means to say, and their, their pricing model is per user. So it meant to say that every meetup organizer, if they were going to edit their own records, which is our eventual objective, um, then we'd have to pay some money every month for every one of those, even if they're not keeping their data up to date. And that added up to a significant cost. Um, uh, there is a low code pl platform released by kind of Honeycomb, released by Google a couple of months ago, which I also looked at, which I think is their attempt to, to try and um, getting get in on, on Airtable's game. Certainly not there yet, not as sophisticated, but it had exactly the same model of if you want to restrict this, you have to pay per user and therefore the costs escalated quite quickly. That was one of the, the, the main reasons why um, we decided that what we wanted to do was implement directories on the platform that the website's on, which is WordPress. Um, keeping those costs down even when we've got lots and lots of meetup organizers who are uh, able to edit it. Um, there are other things in there. Um, better integration, it's much easier to be able to integrate that information with other lists, other features that are on, on the website, if it's uh, part of the website. Um, and uh, control over the data. I mean, we know where it's hosted. Sorry, Sophie, am I running over? No, uh, Kerry's just got to go for dinner, I believe. Oh, right. <laughs> Thanks, Kerry. Bye. Bye. Um, the last one is probably the more significant one, which is that, that we want to have other directories on the Sheffield Digital website, and this is a good proof of the case. So one of the, the, the big shouts is, is that for a freelancer directory on the website uh, for our members. Um, 
So, uh, and therefore this, this might prove that case. Um, questions. So this is me trying to get uh, feedback from you about what I have got wrong, whether this is, sounds like it's useful, whether it will do anything for you. Um, so now it's, it's kind of over, open up to, to, to questions. If anybody has any. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, so I've got one question, really. Uh, I think the cross-pollination everything is pretty great, to be fair. So since we moved to like using meetup.com, uh, it really helped kind of other people discover that we existed. And before that, it was pretty much just word of mouth. So uh, somebody in the company would see it, and they'd tell somebody else in that company that they'd heard about it, they'd tell their friend, etc. But once we started meet, like hosting on meetup.com, because other people attended other tech events in the area, you get cross-pollinated with them saying, this is a programming event, you'd probably like to go here. So I think that's a great idea to kind of get other people from other groups to kind of uh, go to other groups as well. Uh, but uh, for kind of editing the content, is there going to be some kind of sync between like meetup.com or are we expected to just kind of uh, update our own data manually? No. I I don't see this, I, I see this is linking to meetup.com. So this isn't going to issue tickets or uh, provide any of that kind of, of, of community around each meetup. So there is still a need for a ticketing platform or a meetup uh, discussion platform. I'm you know, pointing at things like Slack and a meetup and, or um, uh, other platforms, um, I think is, is also important. Um, synchronizing, we kind of, we do some synchronizing at the moment through um, Open Tech Calendar into our event calendar. And I'm trying to think about how we could possibly uh, close that loop so that basically when somebody sees it, they can click on a link and it shows them the entry in their calendar, in, in, the, in the event calendar and the stuff that's around it. But I'm not quite sure how that will work at the moment. Um, I yeah. think Chris is gonna come in and talk about some, some stuff around Open Tech Calendar now. I hope he is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so at the moment, there, there's syncing between meetup.com and, and OTC. So if you run an, a, a, a meetup.com event, you can add your meetup.com URL to the record in Open Tech Calendar, and Open Tech Calendar will pull in your events. Uh, you have to refresh the sync every three months or so, um, so that we don't end up with you know like a ton of legacy connections. Um, but it should send an email out to you reminding you to go and refresh the link. Um, I think we need to be really cognizant of this. We don't want to create additional admin burden and overhead. So, you know, if, if you've already got um, if you've already got a, a meetup.com profile, we should be pulling your event, you know, information from meetup.com, and the same with Eventbrite, and this and the same, you know. I, I can't help thinking that this should at least in part be part of the functionality that we build out with an open tech calendar as well. Open tech calendar has got this groups feature, which is a little bit confusing to understand, but essentially a group in open tech calendar is a, is a, an organizing group. Um, so is it's a meetup, um, or, or it's a, it's a, you know, event series. Um, and then there are individual events, you know, that are, organized by that group well that I mean that that model is what we're reproducing here so if you've ent you've got all of that data into open tech calendar either enter directly or through the sync to meetup.com um, why would you need to re-enter it all on I think there is a, there's a distinct difference between an entry about a regular meetup yeah and information about what's happening at the next one so yes. meetup.com um, uh, less so Open Tech Calendar, which is, there's a bigger overlap, but it's about, I've got this speaker and it's at this time on this day. No, 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 but, but they, you see, a bit like Eventbrite, they, you, you also have the organizer profile. Yeah. So, that, so there is already an organizer profile in both of those platforms. Um, I don't think we should be in a position where we're creating yet another, um, you know, record that has to be in, individually updated by the organizers. It just gives organizers even more things to keep up to date. And they're much more focused on keeping the big platforms up to date than they are keeping Sheffield Digital up to date. 
th th there is also um, there's another use case I think um, you know you had community organizers as one of the one of the user types um, I think there's also the use case where community organizers would like the list to be populated on their own website or platform so you know thinking of things like Sheffield geeks that have a list of, of, of meetups already which is which is hand hand updated um, I think Ian may even have built it actually who, if he's still on the call um, hey uh, it's on github so it's like anyone can contribute it's uh, it's a bit higgledy piggledy but it, it's usable and you <clears throat> you're completely right in that it's it's just another thing for people to update and yeah. so if you check the commit history you'll find people don't update it that often i don't think the information on that is particularly reliable no and, yeah. and it'd be nice if it was i mean if it would be, if, if we could provide a feed from if we do this and if we do make you know sensible connections to other data sources and and you know allow it to be displayed quite nicely then it would be nice to make that available to to other sites to embed into their websites so we pull out from the meetup api at the moment uh die next events and things like that so we'd have to update our own website we also we was at some point in time we're using like a google uh sheets document to coordinate kind of because there's a couple of like scheduling speakers and we end up just standing onto each other's toes so we kind of just bend that idea and we put everything in meetup because even if it's not kind of fully scheduled yet we still put the the person's name in there who we think they're going to be attending and put that as a draft. So that's like our kind of, um, our kind of single reference for everything because we found like having lots of different documents all over the place and having to update things, people would update one and not the other and things like that. And it get confusing too. Fair. So it is quite good just being able to, well, if it could pull from just one source or many sources, that'd be useful. Yeah, I, I, again, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we don't go over into trying to do the things that Meetup does. Uh, that 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 um, putting the organizer information in, I think, is an, is, is probably a, a an interesting one. Can I pull in that information um, from uh, various sources about um, uh, different groups? But this is a directory of Meetups, not the the events they run. Yeah, because yeah. Because that's already taken care of. We, we can't provide the, the same facility as meetup.com um, uh, or Eventbrite, um, uh, and they already do it, and they, they do it very well, um, uh, and they're, they're huge networks. So I want to make sure that we limit the scope to this is about one entry for Sheffield.net. But if you get a new organizer on board, um, or you change what day of the week it's on, or we can pull up the date of when the next event is, that might be interesting. I, I think, I mean, I think, you know, we need to kind of analyze the data that exists and where we might pull it from um, and see how we can display it. But I, I can imagine, you know, a, a system that pulls, you know, where you, you, can, you can enter, you know, URLs to your, your records in maybe Meetup and Open Tech Calendar maybe Eventbrite as well and it, it pulls in what it thinks the most valid information is and gives you the opportunity of adding adding some more that that we would like for, for our particular um direction so, so the york developer people so there's a, a kind of entity called york developers which is a um uh, a charity in york and they even though their website is atrocious but they have some functions as your functions which go aggregate all the different feeds like Eventbrite, meetup.com and a few other ones and just stick them into one kind of YAML file, which they use like Jekyll to kind of display on their site. Um, so kind of having something like that would maybe would be quite useful. I don't know. Yeah, no, that, is, that, that is interesting. So I've done stuff through, as you suggested, uh, Google Sheets before and, uh, and, and poured stuff from meetup.com API into that. So I probably need to look about that. Those APIs aren't difficult to, to use, but I think Chris has, has, has highlighted the, the bigger problem, which is different data is in different platforms, and and how do you how do you aggregate that? How do you say for this event, actually this information is the important bit, um, and and this isn't. We don't populate this in in, in Eventbrite. We populate that in Open Tech Calendar. 
Yeah. Um, sorry. Okay. I was just going to say, I, I certainly don't think that our record would be anything like a master record. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be expecting you to use it as the canonical that then populates other services. <laughs> the opposite of that, you know, it would be an aggregation of what is already there in other services that we can display and, and curate more easily and share with others. Um, so Simon's just left, but he did write that uh, the user stories look excellent, but he would add one thing for under meetup organizer stories, looking for another meetup to run a joint event with. So I don't know if that's like a flag or something you could put on the meetup entity, which is that they're open to running joint ventures or anything like that. It, or if there's some kind of yeah, filtering system that organizers could use. I, I think they're probably down to making sure that we've got valid names for people so you can, you know, you can reach out. So if you, 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 you can find the name of the person who runs it and feel that if you send an email to them, that they are the right person. It's probably enough for you to be able to find out whether they're interested in a joint event or not. Okay, cool. So again, it's about that, that enabling the network to happen rather than trying to codify all of the different reasons why somebody might want to, to network with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. I mean, that, 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 that one about contact is, is an interesting one. Um, you know, so there's kind of there's almost like two tiers of meetup where it's, you know, some meetups use the personal email addresses of the organizers mm -hmm. and and other meetups have got their own domain they've got they've got they've registered an email address and a, a you know a organizational contact information for it and they may also have a website under that address and other and other things um i i think you know we it it's perfectly fine to to obviously meetups want to be contacted and there's they provide a way of getting in touch um but it may be an opportunity to, to encourage um, organizers to set up uh, an, an organizational set of contact details. Yeah, it's, it's, about, it's about the, having some kind of confidence that that email is going to go somewhere and be answered. Yeah. Because there are quite a, few, the, quite a few events where the name that you've got is no, is no longer valid or the email address for the the, the, for the event or for the for, for the meetup doesn't go to anybody who's going to deal with it. So it's about the confidence in, in that contact method. Most of our communication comes through Twitter. So we either get messages like DMs on Twitter that we never, nobody ever sends us emails to organizers at .net, chef uk. even though we display that. Um, everything is literally just DMs on Twitter. <laughs> All about the Twitters. Yeah, it's just, yeah, I think it's just because it's just easy for people to do, do into it. Yeah, around the phone, so it's pretty easy. Yeah, I, I and it's open to everybody. Twitter's such a, it's such a good, it's such a good way of communicating for a meetup anyway, because of course you can, you know, you can talk to your audience, you can put in speakers, you can app them, you can share the content um, from the meetup, you do your prom promotions through it and, and it, you know, as you say, act as a, as the best way of getting in touch. So, yeah. I, mean, I one of the things that we said at, a pre at previous uh, meta meetups, we wanted to um, produce is like a community drafted guide to running meetups. You know, this is, I think it would be really good for us to kind of, to c continue with that. And I, I know we kind of sketched one out at the last meetup, which was nearly a, a year ago now. Um, but it would be really good to have like a Sheffield community meetup guide um, with best practice in it and uh, you know things like that like how how people um, communicate and how they use the various services that exist and how much they cost and all this kind of stuff cool, cool. Uh, so yeah I think is that all you have for your slides or yeah and I'm not sure that um, uh, the showing my dodgy uh, WordPress interfaces is going to impress anyone so um, uh, we'll forego the demo. Um, uh, apart from to say that, Ian, I need some design help. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, am I what, sorry? I need some design help. You're on the call. I mean, that's as good as volunteering. <laughs> All right. I mean, I'm, I, I'd, be, I'd be happy to take a look at through what you've got. You know? Cool. I might, get, I might drop you some, um, some, uh, some things and, uh, and see if I can convince you to, to sketch something for me. Yeah, with, with a pencil. Yeah, that'd be fine. That'd be great. I think, yeah, I think that's probably what, what I need. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll try and make time. Yeah, I'll try and give it a go. Definitely. Thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, so obviously we've already overrun and we've not even got to section three, which is discussion <laughs> points. So, and as a number of people have had to leave, I'm happy to keep this running and open and talk about the other points that uh, I got and posted earlier. Or I have a proposal, which is we post them in the meetup or meetup ops channels in Slack and kind of open it up for discussion to the other meetup organizers who couldn't attend. I've had some messages from people whose work just bled past six o'clock, so they couldn't turn up. Um, and that could be a good way of um, getting some more discussion from the people that we haven't talked to this evening. Uh, but I'm open to keeping it open, this, this running if people want to. I need to run off and get some tea, unfortunately. So, um... Cool. Uh, yeah, I need to go as well. Yeah. Um, cool. I'll post those in. I'm assuming everyone here is in the Meetup Ops Slack channel. Uh, if you're not, let me know and I can add you. Um, and I'll do that. But yeah, this has been really good. Uh, thanks so much, Sophie. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. That was really interesting. Yeah, thanks for hosting. No worries. Uh, thanks for all for turning up and sticking around until way past eight. I say it's way past eight, who it feels late to me. Um, yeah, this is good. Uh, we'll be posting the video online at some point, I guess. Chris, we'll talk about that, but yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, thanks guys.